Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy is going to talk about several instances of weird weather. First, he'll talk about the 1974 tornado super outbreak. Then he'll tell the story of record-breaking weather in 1943 South Dakota. Finally, he'll talk about the Great White Hurricane that hit New York City in 1888. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Seventy-five percent of the world's tornadoes occur in the United States, but the most damaging kind of tornadoes are really rather rare. On average, there will only be about seven tornadoes a year in the United States that have the potential to do devastating damage. Yet, the night of April 3rd and 4th, 1974, the United States saw 30 such tornadoes in just an 18-hour period. The 1974 super outbreak is history that deserves to be remembered. On April 3, 1974, a mass of cold, dry air dropped down from Canada, moving towards the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys. At the same time, a mass of warm, wet air was coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. There were what the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration called sharp temperature contrasts between the two fronts. And above the two fronts was a particularly intense jet stream, moving at some 40,000 feet. The National Weather Service was differently organized in 1974. Key technologies, such as Doppler radar, were not yet developed. Detection systems were not just more rudimentary, but also not ubiquitous, and many weather stations had no form of radar at all. Systems for emergency warning and emergency response were also inconsistent across jurisdictions. Many towns did not have warning sirens. The National Weather Service recognized the storm's potential, but given the technology of the time, they did not fully understand either the level of risk, nor where the severe storms would erupt. While warnings were issued, they did not fully impart the danger of the approaching storms, and in many cases, miss the areas that would be most affected. In fact, what was developing was, in many ways, perfect conditions for tornadoes. The warm air rose quickly, pushed not only by the temperature difference between the two fronts, but the effects of rapid local cooling caused by rainstorms and evaporation, along with daytime surface heating. As the warm air rushed upward, it began to spiral, and then was pushed along by the powerful jet stream. Last April, in the newspaper of the Indiana News and Tribune, Dr. David Call of Ball State University likened the conditions for the 1974 super outbreak to turning up perfect sevens on a slot machine. Everything has to align perfectly. If the jet stream had been slower, if the air had been just a little bit cooler or a little bit drier, if there had been more cloud cover, then the storm would not have been as devastating. But all of that was very difficult to see with the weather prediction technology that we had in 1974. And the nation really had no idea what was coming. The first tornado reported to touch down was around 1 p.m. local time in Gilmer County in north central Georgia, destroying several homes. In 1974, scientists did not have a common language to describe tornadoes. Ted Fujita, a severe storms researcher at the University of Chicago, had created the Fujita scale in 1971, but it had not yet been widely adopted. While it included estimated wind speeds, the Fujita scale was based on the damage the tornado does to human structures and vegetation. The tornado in Gilmer County, which cut a nearly 16-mile path to Fannin County, was estimated to be an F2 on the scale that ranged from F0 to F5. If F2 sounds small, realize, as meteorologists are fond of saying, there are no small tornadoes. An F2 is capable of causing significant damage, tearing roofs off of frame houses and destroying mobile homes. Within an hour, another tornado touched down near the town of Cleveland, Tennessee. The tornado, an F3, enough to lift automobiles off the ground and throw them, hit a subdivision with 20 trailer homes, destroying 19 of them and claiming the first fatality of the outbreak. Two hours later, another F3 struck the same area, destroying dozens more homes and killing three more people. Emergency services in the town of only some 20,000 were overwhelmed as dozens of injured people arrived at hospital emergency rooms. Twenty minutes after the first fatality in Tennessee, another tornado struck rural Indiana, 350 miles away. 
The DePauw tornado was a huge F5 that traveled more than 65 miles. It was one of the largest of the tornadoes of the super outbreak, but less well known because the area hit was so rural and the tornado sometimes lacked a defined funnel despite doing F5 damage, wiping away nearly two-thirds of the homes in the tiny town of DePauw and devastating the unincorporated community of Daisy Hill. DePaul resident Thelma Matthews told the Louisville Curry Journal at the time, I looked up and I saw a big two-story house coming over the hill. The tornado claimed six lives. In the devastation, the capriciousness of the weather showed. A couple in a car towing a trailer were caught on State Road 64. The tornado ripped off the trailer, smashing it, but left the couple in the car. The roof was torn off an elementary school south of the Indiana town of Palmyra, but none of the children, huddled in hallways with the teachers, were injured. Ten minutes later, and roughly 180 miles east, a tornado touched down near the town of Bellbrook, population around 1200, in southwestern Ohio. As the tornado moved along, it strengthened and formed what is called a multiple vortex tornado, a tornado where one or more vortices rotate around the main vortex. Roaring along at 50 miles per hour, the F5 storm headed for the town of Xenia, population about 25,000. The storm could be seen on weather radar, and the local radio station was able to provide a brief warning to the residents. The tornado destroyed the Xenia High School. School was out, but there was a group practicing for a play. They'd just taken shelter in a hallway when the tornado dropped a bus on the stage where they had just been practicing. In all, five schools, the high school, a junior high school, two elementary schools, and a Catholic school were destroyed by the tornado, as well as nine churches and 180 businesses. Five people died when the tornado destroyed an A&W restaurant. Nearly half the city was destroyed, as was an estimated three-quarters of the campus of Central State University in, in nearby Wilberforce. A witness told the Chillicothe, Ohio Gazette, I've been through World War II, and this is worse than any of the bombings in Germany. Thirty-two people were killed, more than 1,100 injured. Part of what was striking about the tornado in Xenia is that many of the injured had taken proper shelter due to the warnings, but the storm was so severe that it damaged or destroyed even poured concrete, still reinforced basement walls. An hour later, another F5, the only recorded tornado of F5 intensity in state history, struck Brandenburg, Kentucky, nearly leveling the town of 1700 and killing 24. The same superspell spawned an F4 tornado that cut a 20-mile path near Louisville, killing three. As storms ravaged the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys, more storms developed in the south. Around 6.30 in the evening, another F5 tornado touched down near the small, unincorporated town of Tanner in north-central Alabama. The tornado was on the ground for nearly 90 minutes, traveling 52 miles, and killing 28 people. As rescue crews arrived in Tanner, even while the first tornado was still moving, a second F5 vortex formed less than a mile from where the first had started, and it struck Tanner again. Yes, two F5 tornadoes struck the same small town in a 30-minute period. Striking just as rescue units were arriving, the second tornado destroyed most of the few structures that had been left by the first. The 500-yard wide tornado traveled 50 miles, killed another 22 people. The devastation continued into the morning of April 4th, with the last confirmed tornado striking North Carolina around 8 a.m. local time. In all, 148 tornadoes were confirmed in a period of just 18 hours, hitting 13 states and the Canadian province of Ontario. It was the first tornado outbreak in recorded history to produce more than 100 confirmed tornadoes in a 24-hour period. The path of destruction was almost beyond belief. At one point, 15 tornadoes were on the ground at the same time. The tornadoes of the super outbreak devastated nearly 900 square miles altogether and had a combined path of more than 2,600 miles. 315 people died as a result of the storms, including 77 in Alabama, 71 in Kentucky, 47 in Indiana, and 45 in Tennessee. More than 5,400 people were injured. Thousands of structures were destroyed. In some cases, whole towns were destroyed. Damage in the United States alone was estimated at more than $3.3 billion in today's dollars. The super outbreak also dramatically changed how tornadoes and severe storms were tracked, understood, improved tools for storm prediction and warning, and transformed the way the United States dealt with natural disasters. President Nixon, at the time embroiled in the Watergate scandal, visited Xenia a few days after the tornado hit. As president and vice president, Nixon had visited many disaster areas following hurricanes and even earthquakes. Of Xenia, he said, I would say in terms of destruction, just total devastation, this is the worst I have seen. The president declared Xenia a disaster area. 
Although the Federal Disaster Relief Act, which formalized the process for presidential disaster declarations, helping to coordinate federal relief efforts and authorizing additional funds, had been introduced in 1973, it had not yet passed Congress. According to Nixon, the 1974 super outbreak accelerated passage of the act through Congress in 1974. Ted Fujita himself surveyed the damage, using it to refine his scale and drawing the first ever map of a tornado super outbreak. Mapping and classifying the outbreak's 148 tornadoes took three months, and Fujita put on nearly 13,000 flight miles visiting the locations. The map and the devastation of the super outbreak demonstrated the value of a common language and scale for studying tornadoes, and convinced the National Weather Service to adopt the Fujita scale. The scale depended upon analysis by meteorologists and engineers surveying damage after a storm, and later researchers applied the scale retroactively to virtually all recorded tornadoes in the U.S., allowing a better understanding of how severe storms spawn tornadoes. The U.S. weather system in 1974 was determined to be inadequate. At the time, most facilities that were equipped with radar used the WSR-57, meaning the Weather Service Radar 1957 model. The system was difficult to use, and while it could be used to pinpoint the position of a storm, it did not indicate what direction it was headed, nor could it show the motion of rain, hail, and snow relative to the radar site, making it very difficult to predict tornadoes. What's more, the national coverage was entirely inadequate, with just 66 radars to cover the entire United States. The 1950s model radars depended upon vacuum tubes, had little overlap in the system when a station's radar was down, which happened frequently. The improved WSR-74, Weather Service Radar Model 1974, used transistors rather than vacuum tubes, but otherwise used the same limited technology. The devastating storms helped to spur the development of Doppler radar, a Cold War development intended to track incoming Soviet missiles. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration were testing Doppler radar in a laboratory by 1977, and in 1991 Congress approved a nationwide system. The switch to Doppler radar, which allows the meteorologist to see what is going on inside the storm, has dramatically improved the ability to predict tornadoes and provide valuable warning time. Finally, prior to 1974, many towns had not prepared for severe weather disasters. Xenia, for example, had no tornado siren warning system. As a result of the 1974 super outbreak, hundreds of communities invested in tornado sirens, and hundreds of schools instituted plans that included tornado drills, something that was rare before the outbreak. By studying the 1974 super outbreak, scientists learned quite a lot about tornadoes and how they behave. In 2007, the National Weather Service retired the Fujita scale and replaced it with a new enhanced Fujita scale, which better defines the damage to structures that are used to determine the intensity of the tornado. And among other things, the new EFS recognized new scientific understanding, which realized that the damage to structures can occur at much lower wind speeds than at one time was previously assumed. Another super outbreak in 2011 spawned a stunning 360 tornadoes and caused 324 fatalities. Most of those, 238 of them, were in Alabama. However, the 2011 super outbreak developed over a longer period of time, developing over three days, and covered a smaller geographical area, most in the United States Southeast. The 2011 event also spawned far fewer intense tornadoes, that is, tornadoes of intensity EF3 to EF5. While meteorologists argue that both qualify as super outbreaks, the stunning 65 intense tornadoes in just an 18-hour period in 1974 is still exceptional. In 2013, the weather tracking website U.S. Tornadoes overlaid the 1974 storm track over a 2013 map and determined that the same storm today would be passing over, because of urban sprawl, much more developed and populated areas, which exponentially increases the potential for damage. Of course, the nation is much better prepared today. For example, the National Weather Service in 1974 had just 52 stations. Today they have more than 120, and the old 1950s radar has been replaced by Doppler radar, which has increased the lead warning time for a tornado from effectively none in 1974 to 12 to 14 minutes. But even that much preparation is only so much help in the face of nature's wrath. After all, it is only a matter of time before the slot machine once again turns up perfect sevens. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. So weather is an interesting part of history because it is completely outside the realm of human control, and until relatively recently, outside of even prediction. This episode's a good example because this is very recent history, um, and 
we still couldn't predict it. They, they was total surprise when it happened. So what are your thoughts on weather kind of as historical events? It's it, part of what made this episode interesting. Part of what made the outbreak interesting is the way that it changed weather technology. That we, it was kind of nationed at the time. We had uh, we had radar, but we only had a little bit of radar. It's funny the way that they the way that you track the storm is that you laid a, a sheet of onion skin over the radar and drew it with a outlined it with a pencil. Wow! And, and that way you could track track it moving because there was no way for it to track. So it's this one of the things that's interesting about the story is we're kind of right on the cusp of being able to do something like see this outbreak coming, the super outbreak coming, and, and war people. Uh, and because of this, we changed the way we do weather technology in the United States. Of course, it's still imperfect. And there's only so much you can do when you got some, I mean, this sort of a super outbreak, what are we going to do? I mean, whole towns, whole cities were being destroyed. Uh, but it, that's part of the history is that the history of how we understand and then work to predict weather is tied to the history of weather. And in this particular case, because it was so big, that it was so deadly, it really did drive changes that the technology was there, just no one had, had the impetus to go and put it in. And it's the reason that many towns in the Midwest have tornado sirens. And see, that's incredible, because I think now I, it's omnipresent. I mean, there's a there's a tornado yeah. siren here in Casper, and we almost we almost never get tornadoes uh, occasionally. <laughs> I should knock on wood when I say that. That's the uh, <laughs> but it's. It, it really is interesting because they, you're right. There's not much they could have done about it, even if they had known it was coming. And we're still kind of in that position. That Yeah, but there were parts of this, the way this hit, that if you'd had the 15 minutes warning, which they think they can do these days, uh, then it probably would have saved lives. I mean, because there was some just terrible stuff that happened in this outbreak. And, it's, and it's, 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 it's not the only super outbreak in the history of the United States, but it's interesting because it was so widespread. Uh, and that's that's what was unique is it's just storms all over the country and and that uh, that is history the way it changes history the people that died deserve to be remembered but one of the the biggest reasons to do this episode that that was made it interesting to me was the the, the weather technology at the time uh, and what what we had and what we are about to have it was right on the cusp of this sort of massive change in our capacity to be able to at least predict and, and, and warn people about things like this as well as in terms of things some business you know, building codes and stuff like that, that that make us more resistant to weather like that today but you know it's still you know these these f4s and f5s can hit and they can do massive damage and and uh, uh, you know there's only so much weather radar can really do in the in the face of you know mother nature yeah there's only there you're right and that's why I mean we still have people if we had figured out the solution to weather, I think we, uh, we'd, we'd be in a better place. But that's the that's 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 science fiction stuff. Yeah. 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 Right. That's the and we've we've got some stuff that's kind of crazy where they talk about like seeding storms and stuff like that. Uh, but we're still not. Well, you know, cloud seeding's been going on forever. Yeah. That where they yeah. go and drop dry ice out of. And you know, I honestly, I'm not a I'm not a meteorologist. I don't know how much it changes anything if that's if that's all crazy talk or if they're actually doing something. And uh, I, you know, it, it's interesting if you read a lot of science fiction. One of the very first things that they talk about is a, for a change for humanity is controlling weather because can you can do that from a satellite? Think of all the lives that you can save. Yeah. Uh, and and honestly, it seems like that's the craziest thing you could talk about because uh, you know what is the hubris that humans can try to hold back the weather that you can push back the hurricane that's 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 a uh, well it's a reason that it's written into science fiction yeah and there's just but i mean you can see why you'd want to do that with this storm when you look at this yeah. storm and how how devastating well, and it was and, the weather has punctuated human history repeatedly i mean across yeah. across all of time across any civilization absolutely there, it yeah. has and that's that's true from you know just single events like this where there's I, you know, we, we couldn't predict it in 1974, but something like this happens. I mean, even if it happened in the exact same place, you know, a thousand years before, <laughs> there was, yeah, who knows? Yeah. have even less. And, I mean, there's, there's a lot, of, but I mean, there, there are many times in military history where fleets, entire fleets uh, were just destroyed by a sudden storm and that changed, altered history. And uh, we've, we've done some. Uh, in, you know, episodes on the history guy, like uh, Hurricane Cobra. I mean, I mean, uh, literally, the the storm did more damage to the fleet than the Japanese could have done at that point in the in the war. So, I mean, there's uh, it, weather is powerful and it powerfully affects historical events, and uh, yeah. it, and it powerfully affect, affects people's lives. And you know, you can think... all the things we talk about in human culture. I mean, weather is more powerful than that. Yeah, and it's. I mean, we've written a couple of episodes fairly recently. Uh, the uh, Bernardo Galvez. With uh, his I, the, yeah. the hurricanes kept yeah. shaking, <laughs> or yeah. he built a fleet uh, and they get and, they, and the hurricanes get him. Yeah, the American uh, American Samoa, where you know all the ships are ready to fight, and then the typhoon comes through and just sinks everybody. Yes, it sinks uh, everything. Yeah, 
And that's I was I was thinking about the Battle of the Chesapeake too because that was so important to the American Revolution. And they were sailing. De Grasse was sailing his fleet up through, and he stayed outside of lanes because he didn't want the British to find him. So he's sailing through the most dangerous part of the ocean at the time during hurricane season. If a hurricane had hit De Grasse's fleet. Uh, then uh, maybe you know they they evacuate Cornwallis at Yorktown, uh, or Washington doesn't even go down there because if you if if, if Cornwallis can evacuate, there's no reason to, and that means that maybe the American Revolution goes on for another decade. So it's uh, it, it's all this this kind of you know matter of luck because there's yeah. nothing that you could do, no matter how good a ship you built, there's nothing that you could do about hurricane season in the in the 18th century. So now I mean now we stand in a place where we've got there's a lot more that we. Can hopefully do and this one remains i mean the 1974 outbreak was was significant even compared to the the more recent one the 2011 outbreak and it's incredible how much more we we're prepared compare comparatively and yet still yeah. i mean we can't you to some extent you can't plan for what's going to happen before it happens i think this one into you talk about you know we had this technology is that to some extent it doesn't seem like you need the technology until you see a reason for it and yeah that might come with a tragedy. I mean, I think we, I mean, even to a lesser extent, you know, the cold weather in Texas, it's hard to blame uh, utility companies for not winter proofing their stuff when I, wh yeah. when were they ever going to have to deal with that until they did, right? And that's... Well, I mean, the, the power grid in Puerto Rico. I mean, you yeah. know, we know the Puerto Rico's in the Caribbean. We know that hurricanes are going to hit Puerto Rico, but I mean, it's, it's only going to happen every so often. Who's going to put a lot of money into it until you got to? And yeah. uh, that's we learned that you know uh, repeatedly we learned that and that this, the things that hit us are those things that they call the hundred year storm or the thousand year storm or whatever the ones that's the rare ones that you're not prepared for because uh, who's you want to put money into it until it's until it's too late even if you know what this happen. is. This is a good and interesting example of that because we knew we had the technology for better weather radar and for better coverage. And we knew that the system that we had didn't cover well uh, and uh, no one wanted to put the money into it and t think to put the money into it until they found out something like a super outbreak could occur. Yeah. And suddenly it's very important that you can even get those 15 minutes. Um, one of the things I, I was kind of thinking about was that we we give a kind of agency to these storms, almost as to not all storms but there's throughout history we've done that with this idea that oh, sometimes weather seems to do it on purpose <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I, I mean it, it doesn't I, I think about the the divine wind when the fleet tried to sail for japan mm -hmm. and th this idea that there was any causative agent there when truthfully there's just some luck uh well i mean we, we I, earlier in the episode i used the term mother nature i mean we, we we even take you know the force of nature and we tend to try to make it like it's a person that's yeah. making decisions and and uh, and there's there's something you know very uh, patriarchal about the fact that we gave that a you know it's unpredictable and violent and so we uh, but it can be you know kind and sweet and so we name it a mother nature yeah as, uh, but we do and uh, I mean because sometimes weather intervenes in a way that makes such a huge difference and you know you want to think it's on your side I mean uh, there was a belief still kind of argue that Russia is protected by general winter the same way that England is protected by the Channel Russia is protected by the winter of Russia and and so you can see why you might sort of see that. That as, uh, as some sort of you know spiritual power that's protecting you. I mean, the reason uh, I'll, you know, I'll wander into metaphysics here, but I mean the reason that you know you become sun worshippers or weather worshippers, the reason that early paganism started is because these events are so powerful they're beyond human control, and you have to make some sense to them, and so you start to give them these personalities. And the thing is that it's still true today. We don't hold back tornadoes any better than they than they held back thunder when they were deciding that that Thor was the thunder god or that, you know, that, that Jupiter, uh, you know, was the god of war. And uh, so uh, that anthropomorphizing or that, that, that applying, you know, that sort of agency to it, like you talked about, I think it's just because this is predictable and it's terrifying and you want to make it sound like it's, uh, it, or that it's more predictable and it's something you can potentially control. And yeah. that's why, you know, that's why they chuck people into volcanoes or whatever that they were doing to try to appease the thunder gods is because, uh, because you, you can't control it. It's that powerful and you want to. Yeah. And so now maybe we do that with, you know, Doppler radar and, and you know, maybe that's more effective or maybe it's, you know, we're, we're maybe it's... we're, we're <laughs> throwing against the wind in the same way that the Greeks did. I and you're know. certainly right that even if, you know, I, all, all that the radar can give us. Well, and I think everybody has faced having the weatherman tell you something and it be complete nonsense uh, in yeah. terms of what actually happens. And you're like, is, is it raining? The best way to check is to just go outside. Uh, but uh, certainly we're 
way better at predicting rain than we were a hundred years ago uh, or a thousand years ago. Yeah. And and yet yeah. still it's we're still at the mercy of nature. And I think that's that's kind of the interesting. Yeah, still, no, I mean, you can only guess, you know, when the where the storm's going to be at any given time. Or, and uh, so all the time, we you know, the here uh, where I am out and I live in the East St. Louis area, uh, very frequently they'll be telling us that, you know, storm is coming. There's going to be a horrible snowstorm blizzard and it just misses us by, by only a few miles. Maybe it'll be terrible, you know, 10 miles off of here. Uh, and, uh, you know, because the storm, you know, yeah. you, you only get so much idea what's pushing that storm. And, and so, yeah, it's uh, uh, stories of weather are interesting. They're fun stories to tell in history because they can be so powerful. They can be so emotional. And, and it just feels like it's out of control. And those can be uh, I mean, we've told them in all sorts of different ways. I mean, how, the, how, they, how they sunk ships or I mean, we did one I don't know, a couple months ago on how frogs somehow managed to become embedded in hail. And when the hail landed, the frogs were alive. Uh, and, and that's, that's yeah, the craziness of nature. <laughs> and, and so it, I, there's sometimes you got to have a feeling that, 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 you know, we're just we're just not in control. You know, there's there's there are things that are bigger than us. And and, and we have to accept that as you know historical events. I think that sometimes we panic too much on on unpredictability when, you know, that's uh, the, the human race has thrived and lived through unpredictability for the entirety of the existence of the species, because that's you know part of, of nature. That's all we've done. It's the same. I mean, it's the same issue. Ultimately, you know, Aristotle and Plato and people before mm -hmm. that whose names we don't even know were dealing with that same uncertainty. They don't know when the storm's going to come. They don't know mm -hmm. when this, if the storm is going to be, you know, something that wrecks everything or just makes it so their plants can grow. It's and yeah, we might look differently now. We might call science a lot different than uh, than mythology or whatever. But I mean, the, uh, the bottom line is, it, I think, as a historian, I mean, the lesson that you learn, you know, it does get better. And we do get better at controlling things. But I think as a historian, part of the lesson that you learn is that we have to understand that science isn't going to answer everything. Yeah. And that the world is the world and nature and all the things that could affect human history are not uh, necessarily going to be in our control. And, and you know, we we just we got to stop expecting that and and we have to start being resilient enough to understand that we can survive unpredictability that we've done it in the past magellan tv is sponsoring this episode and we'd like to thank them for continuing to make this podcast possible as we usually do on the podcast we talk about what kind of stuff we've been watching on magellan tv lately so what have you been watching recently I, say, I, you know, I love there's a lot of things I love about Magellan TV and one of the things is you can kind of flip through and see a lot of sort of different things. Uh, I, what I watched that I really enjoyed recently was really charming. It's called The World's Most Famous Train. And it is it's it's just a story of this of the train. It's actually it, it's the old Orient Express, which was the, the luxury way to travel across Europe before air travel. They actually the, the cars for the Orient Express have been spread out. Some of them were in museums and I guess one of them was in someone's yard or something like that. Hmm. They went and tracked them down. Uh, and they they refurbished them these 1920s cars so it's 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 a vintage experience they're 1920s but they're trying to give a vintage luxury hotel experience on a train that's going 100 miles an hour and it goes uh, actually from from britain across the english channel uh, i think all the way to it goes to northern italy i think it maybe goes to venice part of its travel log i mean you know why you want to be on this train of course it's very expensive because it's luxury but it's very interesting uh, part of its history because the orient express has a history and they are trying very hard to recreate that meaningfully uh, and uh, and part of it is is you know hospitality management it's just talking about how you run a luxury hotel that goes 100 miles an hour and the challenges of running a five-star restaurant when you're in the width of a rail car. So it's really fascinating, uh, and it was just fun. It was just delightful. I mean, I would love to to take the ride just for the views on the train, and it was fun. And it, you know, it's it's like Magellan TV. I mean, if you want to watch history, if you want to watch science, if you want to watch nature, uh, I mean, there's even some you know like ghost story sort of stuff and that sort of stuff. It's just, there's just thousands of documentaries there, and and you can just go with your whim and watch something you, I never would have expected. I didn't know this train existed. It wasn't going looking for it, uh, and it was just fun. No matter what you're looking. For, for, there's going to be something awesome to watch. Recently, I was watching some really short episodes because they have all kinds of different content from stuff that's going to take you a couple minutes to the hour and a half kind of thing you might expect from a documentary. And I was watching, it's called Best of NASA. And essentially, it's presenting the key findings of some NASA missions. And it's really cool. They're usually just a couple minutes long. Uh, what we're looking at on Neptune or things on Mars and other stuff is what we've learned about monsoons or learned about 
shadows from the moon and cloud swirls and stuff like that. It's it's really really interesting to see just what we're what we're learning. Uh, I I like those NASA ones when I'm on the treadmill because uh, yeah, it, it actually kind of hypes your heart up. You know, yeah. you can get, get get moving on them. Easy yeah. to watch them quickly. Uh, you can watch them on any device, any place in your house. I watch them on my phone. I watch them on the TV. I watch them on the computer. Um, and there's always going to be more to watch. Like like we said, if we had run out of something to talk about, we'll let you know. But I don't think we will. And, of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. And there you will find a deal. Some kind of, sometimes it's a free month, sometimes it's something like money off an annual membership. And if you have not tried Magellan TV and you like watching documentaries, you like stuff like The History Guy, we highly recommend that you go check Magellan TV out. Next, The History Guy is going to talk about some really weird weather that happened in 1943 in South Dakota. And then he'll talk about the Great White Hurricane that hit New York in 1888. And stay tuned after the episodes to hear us talk a little more with the History Guy. It was January 22nd, 1943, and James Homeland, a student at Black Hill State Teachers College in Spearfish, South Dakota, was walking a little over a mile to campus. There was gas rationing during the war, so students usually walked to campus. It was reasonably pleasant for winter in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The temperature was around 50 degrees when she started her walk. By the time she arrived on campus, the temperature had plummeted to minus four degrees. Weather can be unpredictable wherever you go, but few places see weather change, like the Black Hills of South Dakota. Essentially an island in the prairie, the Black Hills have peaks that rise over 7,200 feet, but slope down abruptly, dropping to 3,000 feet in the east. They are the highest mountains between the Atlantic Ocean and the Rocky Mountains, and they are therefore particularly susceptible to the weather phenomena called the Chinook winds. Chinook winds are named after Native American people of the Pacific Northwest, and the term Chinook winds originally referred to warming winds from the ocean that blew into the interior. However, the term now generally refers to a phenomenon common on the east side of the Rocky Mountains in Canada. The phenomenon occurs in many places across the globe and has many names. In Europe, for example, these types of winds are called phone. The general idea is that air blows to a slope, and as it rises up the slope, releases its moisture and compresses, releasing heat into the atmosphere. Then the warm air swoops down the downslope, pulled by gravity, further compressing as it goes. Condensation at the crest of the peak, plus compression as the wind goes downhill, heats the wind. Such winds can cause wide temperature variations and rapid loss of snow, which both melts due to the heat, but also vaporizes or dissipates due to the dryness of the wind. But how much can Chinook winds really change temperature? At 7.32 in the morning on January 22, 1943, the recorded temperature in Spearfish, South Dakota was minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit. At 7.34, two minutes later, it was 49 degrees, a change of 53 degrees in two minutes. By the time that Jane Holman left for her walk, the temperature had risen to 54 degrees. 27 minutes later, the temperature had dropped back to minus 4 degrees. Thus, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, Spearfish, South Dakota holds the world record for both the fastest temperature rise and the fastest temperature drop in world history. Across the region, the temperatures were shifting so rapidly that thick frost suddenly appeared on car windshields as people drove. But such massive changes cannot be attributed to Chinook winds alone. According to the National Weather Service, there was much more going on that day, as a fresh bout of cold air disturbed a static front. Extremely cold continental Arctic air was pushing down from Canada, while warmer Pacific air was pushing from the east. The boundary was west of the Black Hills. It was 22 degrees in Casper, Wyoming, and minus 20 degrees in Rapid City, South Dakota, some 300 miles east and north. The Arctic air was frigid, leading to record cold temperatures, but the warm air was pushing on top of a wedge of cold air, a temperature inversion. As the hills rise above the plains, that means that higher elevations were in the warm air. The two towns of Lead and Deadwood, South Dakota, are so close together that they are often referred to as a single entity, Lead Deadwood. The downtown areas are only two miles apart, but Lead is on the slope of a mountain, and some 800 feet in elevation separates the two towns. At one point, it was 52 degrees in Lead and minus 12 degrees in Deadwood, two miles away. The Weather Service postulates that a bout of new cold air had steepened the cold front. As the front hit the Black Hills, it was disrupted by the terrain. This caused the front to essentially slosh back and forth. 
The cold front would recede and the ward air would drop down at elevation. Then the cold air would shift back. The Chinook winds, dropping rapidly down slope, merely quickened the pace of the sloshing. The Black Hills was, essentially, an island being washed over by competing tides. Witnesses felt winds so warm that they described them as a blast of hot air and assumed there must be a fire nearby. The temperature fluctuated wildly all day. The changes were so pronounced that at times there was distinctly different weather on one side of a city block from another. Plate glass windows cracked because of the changes. Cars nearly crashed as their windshields instantly froze over. Jane Holman's knees turned blue. But the rumors that it caused trees to explode appears to have been an exaggeration. Now the story of the Great White Hurricane that hit New York in 1888. The winter of 1888 had been so mild on the U.S. East Coast, the mildest in nearly two decades, that by early March the trees were already beginning to bud. The robins were returning to the city. It was more than 50 degrees. It was so clearly the coming of spring that in March, March 10th, Walt Whitman, by then 78 years old, living in New Jersey, and the most celebrated poet in the country, if not the world, submitted a poem, a quaint, beautiful poem about the coming of spring called The First Dandelion to the New York Herald for publication. Simple and fresh and fair from winter's close emerging, as if no artifice to fashion, business, politics had ever been, forth from its sunny nook of sheltered grass, innocent, golden, calm as the dawn the spring's first dandelion shows its trustful face the poem was published on march 12th by then it was comically ill-timed the great blizzard of 1888 struck march 11th the weather had previous to the blizzard been unseasonably warm resulting in heavy rains when cold arctic air ran into the warm wet air from the gulf temperatures plummeted and the rain turned to snow. The result did not just create mounds of snow, up to 50 inches, but sustained high winds that earned the storm the moniker, the Great White Hurricane. The nation's weather service, then under the auspices of the Army Signal Corps, knew of the winter storm coming from the west and the warm wet front coming from the gulf, but had predicted that both would be spent before reaching the east coast. The weather forecast for March 11th was light rain. The people had no warning at all. The storm was in full swing on March 12th, yet many New Yorkers still set off for work. There were no worker benefits at the time to pay for days off for snow, and surely the trains would keep running. No one seemed prepared for what was to come. The commuter trains at the time were on elevated rails. They were first stalled due to ice and slick rails, with their small engines unable to find traction. Then by the depth of the snow, and finally by the accidents, as the trains that were still moving were unable to stop and collided with those that were not. Thousands of people were stranded in trains and stations. Enterprising New Yorkers brought out long ladders and charged a small fee to get people down from the elevated trains. The snow fell deep enough that the streetcars came off their tracks, and that service, too, was halted. As transportation was at a standstill, Roscoe Conkling, a former U.S. Senator and aspiring presidential candidate, still very fit and hale at the age of 58, set out on March 12th from his office to walk the three miles to his home. He found himself stuck in Central Park with snow up to his arms. He described it as, as near giving right up and sinking down there to die as a man can do, and not do it. It took him three hours to walk those three miles to safety. A harrowing tale, but not the end of the story. He contracted pneumonia and died six days later. In all, the storm and cold killed some 400 people along the coast from the mouth of the Chesapeake into Canada, 200 of those in New York City. The blizzard was unique. The snowfall totals were not near records for the U.S. Northeast previously or since. The temperature lows were likewise no record, nor were the winds. What made the Great White Blizzard of 1888 unique was the unique combination of snow, wind, and cold, all at the same time. Snow drifted so high that in some places it covered fifth-floor windows. Hundreds of ships foundered or ran aground in the storm. Some 100 of the victims who died were sailors. More died because efforts to fight the cold led to fires, and the fire departments were unable to respond. Still, people managed to carry on. Trapped in anyway, the Ringling Brothers Circus performed two shows in Madison Square Garden as scheduled, mostly to people who were stranded and seeking shelter. While the Great Blizzard of 88 was one to remember, its impact was larger than other statistically more powerful storms. 
The growing, thriving metropolises of the East at the time, now lit with electricity, connected by telegraphs, served by trains, heated by gas, had, in their modernization, become surprisingly vulnerable, as all of these were above the ground. In fact, the electricity wires, broken by heavy ice and high winds, were one of the greatest dangers to city dwellers. More than any other single event, the blizzard of 88 drove cities to move their utility lines and wires underground. It was a large motivation behind the building of the nation's first subway systems, including the nation's very first system, opened in Boston in 1897. The Great White Hurricane changed the very nature of a modern city. So look, I live in Wyoming, and you've lived in both Wyoming and South Dakota, where this this South Dakota episode occurred, right yeah. in the same same area. But yeah, I have, yeah, I, I lived right there. Yeah, never experienced. Never, never quite happened to me. No, no, <laughs> it's a, not when I was there that we had forty degree shifts every hour. Yeah, that's, nothing, that's crazy nothing like a temperature seesaw like that. And so, I mean, I've seen plenty of uh, crazy weather out here, but that's usually more like. A, when I was at the University of Wyoming, that we were we were going to break a record on the number of days it hadn't gotten it hadn't gotten above zero degrees and <laughs> Fahrenheit, <laughs> and so we apparently did not quite break it, if, from what I recall. But oh, uh, I mean, it was break. it was like seven days. Might have broke of... the record when I was there in grad school. Maybe you weren't breaking. <laughs> You weren't breaking one of my records. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've been in some some colder – there in Laramie where the university is, it snows and all the roads out of sight of town close and you're just stuck. But it's nothing – I've never had 50-degree weather changes for, back and forth, literally seesawing in, in a handful of hours. It's ridiculous to think that it even really could happen. And it's the way the fronts came together and the temperature yeah. inversion and the humidity. And I mean, it was a very unique circumstance it, it, just because it was hitting the hills, which are sort of this island in the middle of the prairie. Uh, and then when you look at it, it was it was literally like just like a bucket that was shaking. I mean, the water was just washing back and forth. And I can't I can't imagine. I mean, I lived in those places. You can see how when you when you're because the, the hills are actually very rugged uh, and you can see how, you know, things could be sliding up down the hills. But I mean, like, Lead and Deadwood, these two little towns, I mean, they call them, if you're you know, watching the news and stuff, they'll call them Lead Deadwood. I mean, they are so close together that they're really treated as the same town, even though Deadwood's where you gamble and Lead's where they used to dig gold. But uh, uh, they, literally, when you had, you know, what was it, 40-degree temperature difference in Lead yeah. and Deadwood? That is just, because you're standing in Lead, you're looking at Deadwood. It's 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 just impossible to imagine. So it was just unique. And it, part of it is, growing up in the Black Hills, is that it's just... Uh, it gets some unique weather there because they are such a they're they're oddballs. They're, they're being they're essentially mountains in the middle of the plains in just a little island there. And so it's it's really fascinating. It certainly I mean is for no other reason it deserves to be remembered just because it was craziness. Uh, it, yeah. Luckily it didn't result in a bunch of deaths or anything like that. But I'm sure it resulted in a bunch of confused people. So was it something that was like kind of a local legend when you were because this was well before your time. But when I was growing up, uh, what I was told is that trees exploded because of the change. And and it turns out that that was a myth, that the trees did not actually literally explode. It wasn't changing weather that fast. But yes, when I was a kid growing up, then I at least heard about it now and again, about the crazy time uh, when that had happened. Uh, and it wasn't that far off, I mean, because it was in the, in the 40s, right? But uh, uh, you know, we never saw things like that when I was in the Black Hills. For Even for the Black Hills, it was an absolutely unique phenomenon. It was record-breaking phenomenon. Yeah. Apparently could happen again, but uh, would require some crazy stuff, right? <laughs> that's the... Yeah. That's... But who knows? Who knows? Maybe someday yeah. they'll have they'll have something similar there or somewhere else where it's crazy, crazy weather. But it's just I mean, really certainly you can have a front or something yeah. come in where you can you can feel it get hot or cold or humid very quickly. I mean that'll happen sometimes, you know, like in a rolling front. But this idea of it sloshing back and forth, that yeah, was just, uh, that's the because I've crazy. I've felt it many times when you know when a storm is coming in and you can feel that temperature drop pretty within a within a relatively short time span. You can really feel that that cold weather, the hot, the heat come in. But it doesn't usually uh, roll back <laughs> then in, in 20 minutes, which is just crazy. So, I mean, it's an interesting story, and I just wonder what the what it was like to actually have lived through it. Because it certainly sounds, mm -hmm. go for a walk, it's 50 degrees, and before you get to where you're going, it's <laughs> negative four. That's yes. uh... <laughs> 
It's another thing. You, you, maybe you'd see it in a movie, but uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it really happened. Really happened. Yeah, just it just that's just crazy weather, and and sometimes it's fun to talk about just that crazy weather because it can be you know it's just again so unpredictable, and who's who's even going to think about that? And, you know, the idea that we're ever going to control something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, and this one's uh, less. It didn't uh, alter the trajectory of how we guess, you know, how we predict storms or anything yeah. like that. But yeah, it's... this one there was no big tech change or anything because of it. it was just it was weird enough to mention. Is is well, this was this was a story. Because sometimes it's a ripping yarn, and this one is just a ripping yeah, yarn. I mean, so, can't imagine the people that day going, "Whoa!" You know, <laughs> right? watch, watching the bank thermometer because you got those thermometers on the bank that you know are, they they used to be in lights, and they would come up, and watching that thing shifting had to just be <laughs> crazy, right? And that's, I mean, it's the kind of thing that the people. I mean, I'm sure people who lived through it, told stories about it, still tell stories about it, kind of mm-hmm. thing. Is that there? That was something to live through, and I, I mean, that's history. And we're, the other story we talked about was the the Great White Hurricane. And I think this one's kind of interesting because it, again, takes a little bit of a different angle and kind of how weather and history connect. And it's one of the crazy cool connections there is how it connected with the exact historical situation that was going on there. And so that it was worse because, you know, we were just getting electric lines and stuff and mm-hmm. just figuring out all these things. And it created a unique dangerous situation that wouldn't have existed necessarily, you know, even a couple of years ten, before. Ten years before, yeah. yeah. And it changed the way that we built cities. So that's, there's a couple of reasons why the story is interesting. One is one it had to do with the weather technology prediction at the time. We thought we were getting much better at the time. And they just totally missed the boat here. That storm, actually, that blizzard uh, actually created created a lot of damage and death and all sorts of stuff coming across the Midwest and the Great Plains. And I didn't talk about that part of the storm. Some people mentioned that and might get back to that sometime. But I mean, the fact is, New York, they told them, ah, oh, it's going to be, you know, 40 degrees and, and light rain. And that's that's what they told them. People went off to work on that prediction. And then they got like literally 10 feet of snow in New York City. And they Cars couldn't move. I mean, the, the 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 train cars couldn't move, and the, they couldn't even the horses couldn't even pull the street cars because they were rolling off of the tracks. Yeah, that's uh, and it's it's, yeah, the... it's it's crazy. It's the kind of stuff you living through it is would have been a memorable event. Yes. And, well, I mean, we've been. I mean, we come from the Mountain West, so we've yeah. had you know huge snow dumps come and and you can't get out of your house and stuff like that. I mean, I've I've opened my door to look straight at a wall of snow before, but I mean, they, they just the fact it was so totally unpredictable. They had no yeah. idea and that they this thought, was coming, and they thought they did, <laughs> and they thought they did. But when you look at the pictures of it, I mean, I we, we don't imagine because we've got power lines running now. I mean, if you're in the city, you look and you'll see lines going back and forth. But I mean, nothing. I mean, you know. I, we don't realize what it was like when everything was powered above ground that you had these power lines where there were there were a hundred lines going back and forth across the street every direction and they were and uh, they were totally had no idea that that could be hit by a storm and of course in New York that could have been hit by a nor'easter or a, n- a number of different ways it just happened to be this weird blizzard that came in where you know where the where the cold air ran into the 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 the, the, the Gulf Stream uh, and and it turns out to say you know we were so excited to get everything set up on gas lines and, and power lines and we were moving into the future and we found out how vulnerable the infrastructure was and yeah. it just changed the whole way we did cities it's it's one of the reasons that cities have subways is because of this storm well and the subway has its own vulnerabilities but it does, it does at the very least you can still travel when there's a bunch of snow up <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah your, your cars aren't coming off the tracks because the snow's too deep on the tracks yeah. yeah and that's well and i i just try to i try to think of what it's like i mean i've been in my fair share of storms too but it, not in one I, f- fairly rare uh, to lose power for significant amounts of time. I've been yeah. in some that have done that, but I, I mean... Yeah, in this case, all of the power lines were, I mean, they were newly hung. And, and you know, and people didn't know about safety with them, too. I mean, these things were down all over the city, and they were, you know, they could die from them. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have a lot, but it was one of the most dangerous things is they had trouble with getting people even out on the street because all these power lines were down. So, I mean, here, I mean, they're used to fairly severe weather, and, and the, you know, the, the power guys are out really, really quickly. Uh, I guess that's sexist, right? The power people are out. They're not all. They're not all guys. But uh, uh, and they, 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 you know, they get their power back up very, very quickly. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. But I mean, at the time, I you know, can't imagine. You know, the whole city going like, oh man, we didn't think of that when we when we laid all these miles of wires. <laughs> right. And I guess yeah. maybe they they didn't have the so used to having constant electricity access that uh, that we do today. But it's I. It is if if my power goes out for more than you know just even a couple of minutes, that's going to be notable for the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure there were people who weren't prepared with uh, with alternative heating uh, yeah. or anything like that because they had, they were used to gas heating and suddenly now the gas lines were cut. And the funny thing when I think about this one, because I know my daughter, uh, she would remember this as the best 
fun in her life. I mean, the day that they that we got five feet of snow and they canceled school and they could go out there and play in the snow and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I imagine that. And when you look at the pictures of it, there's kids that just seem to think this oh, is yeah. the most magnificent thing that's ever happened to them. And some people went out and got their sleighs out and they had a grand old time. Uh, you know, while the, Make how the best New York, of it. How New York is it that people grab ladders and then charge people to use them? <laughs> get, them get them off the elevated train. Get off the... That's, uh, there's, there's the capital of spirit for you right there. Yeah, you can see it at Merge, yeah. Well, and what are you going to do? You're stuck up on that. <laughs> They're telling you can't use your ladder. I mean, that's well, I just... mean, in it, there was a lot of loss of life, but yeah. much of the... And th that happens if you have severe storms these days, too. But uh, much of the loss of life was actually at sea, um, and the, the storm rolled out to sea, and that's where people are really at risk, you know, when you get the, the bad blizzard going. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, there's there's some tragedy to the storm, uh, and and the irony, I mean, there's so many good things about it, but the irony uh, that the, the poet laureate, the most famous poet in the nation, had just written this poem about the first dandelion of spring, and it happens to it happens to publish the day after right, the, the, the Great White Blizzard. Yeah, it's uh, Whitman's poem. It's I mean, it's just uh, there. There again was a lot here that was historically interesting and, and was fun to talk about, and and uh, as it was just you know, weather can be surprising and, and it makes history. It was, a, I, I, I loved the, your, your intro to this talking about that. Cause you get to, you even read part of the poem and so, and, uh -huh. and then you're like, and it couldn't have been more. <laughs> it was almost comically ill time. Yes. As the... if, as if, as if Walt Whitman was literally mocking <laughs> New York city's pain, which in that case, you're really looking at it and seeing that once again, we can't control the weather. <laughs> you, <can't>, it... <laughs> I, you know, he was, if you've seen pictures of Whitman, he's got his beard and everything like that. And, he's, and you know, he's sitting there going, you know, it's an early spring. This is perfectly timed. Perfectly you know, people, timed. People will love it. And <laughs> then the blizzard hits. Yeah. And you know, it might it might have changed history because uh, I, I forget his name, but there was a New York politician there that was that that had a legitimate chance to to become president that uh, tried to walk home in the blizzard and ended up dying of pneumonia. And so I mean, you never know. Yeah, you that's... never know how much that might have might have changed. You know, events. Well, when we see, I, I see so many of ones where people who went on to do important things, something happened that could have killed them. I was just reading one recently about uh, LBJ, I think, who uh, got on a plane, uh, the Pacific Theater of World War II. And so he was he was there just to kind of, you know, be there for a, a, on a ride along. And essentially, he has to get off to pee. And so when he comes back, someone else is in his seat. He has to get on the plane behind it. That plane gets shut down. And everybody on it dies. And it's it's one yeah. of those things that, you know, now we can say, well, man, LBJ became president, you know. But it's you wonder how many people who could have or would have in some alternate reality who end up getting killed and things, just things like that. Yeah. And, and what they what they might have changed. I mean, sometimes, you know, those like, the all this of the Kennedy brothers died in the yeah. Second World War. And, and there's a question, you know, what, you know, what would have happened, you know, had he, you know, lived through the war and, uh, and because there was such a political family is. It's uh, it's an interesting story. So we don't we don't really know who all you know was was frozen in a blizzard who might otherwise have changed history. But I mean you know, here there's this you know a specific example of someone who you know credibly yeah. might have been important to historical events. I mean I, you know, one person doesn't make all that much difference, but credibly might have been important to historical events. And the and the blizzard killed him. And uh, you know that's and that's that kind of stuff. Too. That kind of stuff happens every day. And I yeah. I kind of think um, when we talk about weather and we've talked about weather this whole episode. I, one of the things that I think is is moving about it is that weather is is like history, a story of people, and these are things mm -hmm. that people have to live through. And it's there's a connection between us and every other person who's ever lived, ever had any kind of life from the from you know complaining that ah oh, there's an early snow or it's raining and you forgot your umbrella, <laughs> that kind of stuff is that there's there's a piece of that that connects us across all of humanity, and mm -hmm. we. I think that that's there's something special about that for us to be able to say I, I that agree. O often it includes heroism because yeah. be, i mean people come out and save each other's that's you find that all the time is that when you have a, a catastrophe like that people come out with their shovels and people come out and they and they help each other sometimes they charge to use the ladder i guess but uh, it's the, amazing how people work together when they have to uh and uh, and we can all understand the drama because uh, no matter who you are you can you can understand being put in a position where where the the events are bigger than you and you become victim of those events. Yeah. And so, I mean, wherever you are, there's a risk of some kind of weather coming along. California's got droughts now. They're driving yeah. wildfires. And, and uh, you know, you, you know, you live where blizzards come all the time. I live where tornadoes are fairly common. Uh, and uh, all of that says that, you know, we can all identify when people were caught in weather. And so we've, we've had quite a few episodes, I think, on, on weather and the way that weather has impacted history. And it's, yeah. it's always, it's compelling. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that, it's something that connects us all. And I also like that it's not just about you know the big overarching narratives and stuff like that of history but of 
real lived experiences and people who've just had to deal with it because man you're right we can <laughs> i think we can all we can all understand that thank you for listening to this episode of the history guy podcast we hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history and if you did you can find more on our youtube channel at the history guy history deserves to be remembered we will continue to release podcasts every other week so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.